I've been waiting for this moment for so long. And I, now that it's a new dawn, I believe that is the time to get into a new book. Amen. So this is our year of revival. And so I think it's so suitable to get into the book of Acts. Amen. Yeah, it's a good place to clap for Jesus. It's, it's a long journey, and it's loaded with some strong meat and substance. But the beautiful thing about the book of Acts is the flow of the Holy Spirit. So it gives us the opportunity to really continue enjoying watching like a movie in the, in the text, the movements and the workings of the Holy Spirit. The, the, when you look at the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see the Holy Spirit is made reference to about 34 times. And then when you look at the epistles, the Holy Spirit is made reference to in the ep- ep- epistles um, not too many times. I think it's about 20, um, 14 to 24 times. But when you come to the book of Acts alone, just that one book, the Holy Spirit is made reference to about 60 50, 56 times. That tells you really this thing is about the Holy Spirit. And so, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says that the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus. Who is this I? Have I? Because it's important to establish who is talking here. Is it Paul? Is it Peter? Is it Jesus? Who is the one talking here who is making reference to the former treaty? I'm sure if you have been around for a while, when we're doing, dealing with the book of Colossians chapter 4, I made it clear that it was the book of Acts was penned, physical penning, but it was breathed out by God but it was penned by Luke. Luke is not one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. He's actually about the only author in the scriptures who is not Jewish, Gentile author. All the others were Jews, but Luke is not a Jew. And, but it's important to understand this, that the book of Acts was penned written by the, uh, Luke is a physician, medical doctor, Luke. Luke wrote it. And before I go any further, I've said it a few times, but let me reiterate this fact that anytime you hear the author, so Luke being the author of this book of Acts, you hear Paul being the author of the book of Romans, Corinthians, and many more. Peter being the author of the book of Peter and Matthew, book of Matthew, and all that. When you hear this, even in the um, Old Testament, Moses being the author of the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, when you hear things like Isaiah being the author of the book of Isaiah, please let's not confuse. They wrote it but they were not the primary authors. They were the secondary author. The primary author of scripture is God. So then, when someone pins what Paul says to just Paul's opinion, it's an error. Because Paul was not sharing his opinion. Obviously, God did not, when I spoke about the authorship of scripture, I think I taught this a while ago, on Thursday. When, in fact, when Paul was writing, he didn't know he was writing scripture. That's how beautiful it is. God is using you to accomplish something you didn't even have the intention to do. 
So when Luke was writing, he didn't know he was writing scripture. So for instance, Paul writing 1 Corinthians, he didn't know that I'm writing a, a, a scripture. He didn't know it. But it was later that it was, uh, it was attested and accepted, even in the days of Peter, before the Bible was closed, Peter said that what um, Paul wrote was scripture. So they knew that scripture, some of, some of them later on, they knew this is scripture. The point here is that there are other books, other letters Paul wrote, which didn't make it to scripture. I said all this when we were doing Colossians towards the end. There were other things Paul wrote, which they don't make it to scripture. So it's not necessarily Paul's opinion. Even though he was sharing his revelation and insight, that revelation and insight, that aspect of his revelation and insight was scripture. So then I normally get weary when people say, but that's what Paul said. That's what Paul, that's just Pauline. And that's Peterian. No, 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 no. It's not Pauline. It's scripture. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Paragrapha theonupsis. That's the Greek. Paragrapha, all scripture. Theonupsis, God breath. Nupsis. So all scripture, paragrapha. So whether it was in the... Um, the Gospels, what Jesus was saying, or it's in the epistles what Paul, Paul was writing, they are all equally scripture. Not one of them is more scripture than the other. That is very important. Nothing in scripture, no statement in scripture is more scriptural than another statement in scripture. Don't forget an analogia scriptura. The scripture speaks with one voice. Total scriptura. Every aspect of the scripture is scripture. Total scriptura. And sola scriptura. It is only the scripture that defines what is accepted and what is authoritative. The scripture I said some time ago, that's, you see, when you are doing an academic submission or presentation, it is not judged authoritative until you are making references to some authorities. If you are going to talk about um, computer science and you are submitting, submitting, let's say, a dissertation or some thesis or something, you, we need to know your references. You have to refer to some authorities. There are different authorities, so maybe different school of thought. One school of thought is an authority in this. Another school of thought is also an authority, even though they are all dealing with physics. Sometimes there may be uh, variations with the, this school of the authority. This is what they believe. This. But when you are submitting anything, you must have a point of reference. Everything human that must be referred to must also have a point of reference. But the scripture, so now what is the point of reference of the scripture? The scripture has its own authority. It's its own point of reference. <laughs> Hebrew puts it this way. Because God, there was, in chapter 6, there was no greater for God to swear by, he swore by himself. <laughs> Hebrew chapter 6. When he was about to swear to Abraham that I'll bless you, Abraham, I'll bless you. Hebrew chapter 6 from verse, I think verse 14 particularly. He says that, um, verse 13 says that, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no, the problem is you only make oath or covenant by greater ones. But God, there's no one greater. So he had to just refer to himself because himself is the greatest. Himself is the most high. Nothing is higher than the most high. Nothing is greater than the greatest. So God made reference to himself. In the same point, the scripture doesn't need to refer, doesn't need any authority from outside of scripture to validate what the scripture says. But So how do you know it's authoritative? Read it, it will get you. It, I, I think I've taught this already, so I don't have to go into it too much. The, the, the life-transforming power of the scripture, the scientific accuracy of scripture, the infallibility of scripture, the, the, it, it transcends generations. The coherency of scripture Everything is like Isaiah wrote. He never knew about this other uh, author. But when you compare what Isaiah wrote to what Paul wrote, and even though they lived 100 years apart, it's like they were copying each other's notes. 
The scripture speaks with one voice. Right? So coming back to this, when we say it was penned by Luke, it doesn't mean it is Luke's opinion per se. It was the, the primary author of scripture is who? If you are encouraged, this is something you must know. Okay? Who is the primary author of scripture? Who is the primary author of scripture? Paul wrote the book of Romans. It starts by saying, Paul, an apostle. He is the secondary author. So Paul wrote the book of Romans, but who was the original primary author behind Romans? God. You have to understand that. So now, coming back to this point, Luke says that the former treatise, or when you read a different translation, it said the former account. So he was giving an account. Said The New King James says that the former account I made. So he was giving an account. And he says that, oh, Theophilus, what was the account about? The account was about all that Jesus began, uh, Jesus began both to do and to teach. First of all, we have to find out that the account is about what is the account about? What is the account about? About what? It's about what Jesus began. Okay. It's interesting, it's not what Jesus did and teach. He began. That means that he's still doing. That's very important. Jesus began. So he said, I, the former account I made. Which former account is he talking about? Luke chapter 1. Luke wrote, wrote only two books. It, really, they were, uh, theologians believe that they were written and sent together. So, when you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 3, or let's start from verse 1, I think. Let's start from verse 1 now. It says that, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in all, to set forth in order a declaration of the things which are most surely believed amongst us. Now, this tells you that he wasn't only one, the only one writing what he, was, what he was about to write. He also said, I'm also going to... Others have many, many others have taken upon themselves to write. Matthew wrote. Mark has written. John has written. So he said, many... and. In those days, others would also write, but because they were not scripture, it would not make it to scripture. So there were other accounts, like the gospel, I hear this, uh, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Philip. That's the ones they like because it contains a lot of nonsense that flesh likes. <laughs> if flesh makes law, it will leave some things out. Oh, yeah. If you are a thief, why would you make a law? That will catch thieves. No. You make a law about diet. You make laws about dressing or fashion. You make laws about even giving. You make laws about sharing. You make laws about earning. But you make laws about stealing. (laughs) Because that's your problem. (laughs) If you, if you don't have self-control with food, you never preach against food. <laughs> Unless you are a top-rated hypocrite. <laughs> so, Oh, uh, Luke. So Luke says that the former treatise, <clears throat> sorry, for as much as many have taken it up in hand, in hand to set forth in order a declaration of the things which are most, are most sure, surely believed amongst us. Verse 2, even as they have uh, they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So th- these are people who were eyewitnesses. So you know what Luke did? Luke sat down with Peter. He's a doctor now. He likes finding out step by step. He sat down with Mary. I'm sure he went to Mary's house. So said, Mary, I want to ask a few questions about this. So he did all his research. He did all, he's a trained medical doctor. He did all his research 
check with this, check with the eyewitnesses. He might have not been there, but he met the eyewitnesses, asked and to make sure he detailed everything, and he set all of them in proper order. So theologians believed, Bible scholars believe that when you look at Luke's account, the chronological order in which things have been arranged, that's the most accurate. Because he had to get all the information and even saw some information from Peter, from Matthew, and from Mark, and put them together. And he, so he says that verse 3, he says, I, it seems good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, how did he get it? Because he did the research. Having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, he definitely went to Mary and Joseph. From the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theo, Philos. <laughs> so Acts chapter 1, again verse 1, says that the former treatise making references to what he wrote earlier on. The former treatise, have I, that's me, Luke, have I made, oh, Theophilus, did you see that? When he was writing the book of Luke, he wrote to Theophilus. And here, he's saying that Theophilus, the former treatise have I made, oh, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to, to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after uh, uh, he was taken up, after that he threw the Holy Ghost. When was he taken up? After that he threw the Holy Ghost as giving commandments unto the apostles who he had chosen. Verse three, in uh, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Many days will come to that. So now you see that he says that I've made a formal treaty and the formal account was about what Jesus began to do. And then when you read it, it says that I've taken it upon myself to set in order from the first. So everything about the life of Jesus Christ, the human living of Jesus Christ, until, he said it actually here, until he was taken up. Verse 3, until the day he was taken up. So this is very intro interesting. Okay, so he was making reference to all that I wrote in my, it should have been first look, and this should have been second look. All that I wrote in my former account was concerning the things that Jesus began to do and to teach from the very first until the time he was taken up. So that means that everything I wrote in the first book covers, is li limited to when he physically left. So the first account was concentrated only to his physical living. Until he was taken up. So after he was taken up, whatever happened, I didn't cover it. Matthew didn't cover it as well. Mark didn't cover it as well. And John didn't cover it as well. In fact, out of all of them, it was really Luke who captured matters to the very end and some of the details of the things he said just before he left and so when you look at Luke chapter 1 and Acts sorry Luke chapter 24 the end and Acts chapter 1 there seemed to be some overlapping because he spoke about how in Luke chapter 24 verse 49 he told them wait in Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high it's the same thing in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 so it's the same author. So it's like he picked it up from where he left. And where did he pick it up from? Just before he left. So here you see verse 3. He says that, no, um, verse 3. To, talking about his disciples. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. So he spoke about his life after resurrection. Now after his passion talking about, the passion is about the, what he went through, his sufferings, um, his uh, suffering, his crucifixion, his burial, and resurrection. So after his passion, I thought about, I spoke about that thing two weeks, a week ago, or so two weeks ago. After his passion, he showed himself alive again for 40 days. He, they saw him. 
And look at how he puts it. To whom, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, passion uh, by many infallible proofs. It's like you can't deny it. It is so undeniable. You can't, you can't say it's not possible. He proved it. Many infallible, we'll get to that, infallible proof, being seen of them 40 days. And speaking, he was speaking to them as well. So they met him, they saw him so much. Now, Luke says that this account that I have given, I gave till the time he went up. All right. This brings me to a very important point about the book of Acts. It's such a central book in the New Testament that any believer who wants to grow in your appreciation of the full gospel, you have to give it attention. I taught you some time ago that the full gospel is not captured in the gospels entirely. So the gospels tell us the gospels, but we don't have the the picture of the full gospel in the gospels. Why? Because the gospel, definition of gospel, is the news concerning Jesus Christ, his person, and his works. Okay? So if you tell me the gospel have finished with the gospels, you are telling me there's not, none to say about Jesus' person anymore after the gospels or his works after the gospel. But there are things he continued to do. That's why Acts says that the things he began to do. That means I'm going to tell you, the first time I told you the things he began to do and to teach, now I'm going to tell you about the things he continued to do and to teach. So then, the gospels don't capture everything about the works of Jesus Christ. It captures, it said it's Theophilus, from the very first until he was taken up. So the gospel captures the human, physical, earthly life of Jesus Christ. His earthly life when he was physically here, when people could see him, people could touch him. That's why he said in verse 3. He showed himself to them in infallible proof. And they, being, seen, uh, being seen of them alive. So he showed himself alive after his passion with infallible proof. Being seen of him, 40 days of them, 40 days, they saw him. They, John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, he said, that which we have seen, that which we have handled, uh, he said, that which we were from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we, we, we looked upon, and our hands have handled, talking about the word of life. We physically, with our, watch this, watch this, no spiritual senses, natural senses. Natural senses. We heard it. We heard him. We touched him. We felt him. We, we saw him. He says that, so this is not in the ethereal or cerebral realm. It's in the tangible realm. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are very much limited and restricted to the, the tangible life of Jesus Christ on earth. I'm talking about his tangible life. And do you know how the Gospels start? Interesting. Look, he said it. He said, from the first... So Jesus, his physical life has not always been. It, why would he have been born if he was always there physically? He never, God never had human nature until it was initiated in the womb of Mary. That's why the incarnation is such a big thing. The angels came to sing. That unto us a savior to savior is born in the city of David. Angels came when they arrived because John, John chapter 1, verse 14. This thing is amazing. And the word that created everything that exists, that word became flesh. Before then, the word never was flesh. Never had it been flesh because flesh was created, but the word is uncreated. So the cre uncreated, the creature, for the first time became like the creator. So in Philippians, it says, chapter 2, who, verse 5, 
very, he was in the, verse 6 particularly. He took verse 6 that who being in the form of God, though he, he thought it's not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7 says that he took up, but he made himself of no reputation, re, re, reputation and took upon himself the form. So it's like he was there, but he decided to take this upon himself. And was made, watch this, what was made like men. So you see him, you can touch him, you can see him cry, you can see him tired, you can see him sleep. He was behaving in the full spectrum of humanity or human beings and yet he was before he became a human being. So in his incarnation, there was an initiation. Don't miss this one. So he was initiated into the human realm. Say initiation. Prior to that, he wasn't human. He is just God. For the first time, God becomes human and not lose his godness and not also upgrade the humanness. It's the normal human nature. So theologians put it this way. He was not 100% God. If you say 100%, then what was the... 100% means... If he's 100% God, he can't be another any other percentage. This is basic maths. <laughs> How can I tell you that this Bible I'm holding is 100% paper and yet 7 or 10% leather? There is no 100% paper then. It's, it's 93% out the ten percent, so ninety percent paper, and or I can tell you, it is ninety percent paper, two percent ink. Oh yes, and then uh, yeah. So I didn't even I forgot fabric. Like it, this one looks like hair. Hey, some of the sisters say. Hey. <laughs> it reminds me of my wife's beautiful hair. So, <laughs> so, this is 90% paper, 1.3% ink, 1.3%, now I'm going to get it very co complicated for those of you who don't like maths, it is coming. <laughs> it is coming. You run it up. 1.3% what ink, ink, and, and then 1.2% hair. <laughs> I want to call it hair, please. 1.3% ribbon. And then what's left now? 11? Okay, okay, I thought you said 11%. What percentage letter? <laughs> eh? Are you guys, have, are there some mathematicians here? Oh, those people here, they didn't know what's going on. They don't know. <laughs> so, I can't say it's 90% paper and then 10% uh, leather. And yet, 100% oh, paper and 10%. It doesn't. So, Jesus Christ is not 100% man. Get this very carefully. When people say it's 100% man, to a certain extent, it's true. But logically, it's not coherent. Logically, it's in, in the realm of logic, it's called contradiction. If you're 100% something, then you are nothing else. You understand? It's just, that's, but when people say it's 100% man, what they try to say is that he's entirely man in a, every sense of the word. So when you talk about man, when you put... Pastor Frank here, and you put Jesus here. What defines a human being? Jesus is not less than Pastor Frank. Pastor Frank is not more than a human being than Jesus. So he's totally, but the right theological word is truly, not 100%, truly man. He's truly man. That, that's a very important thing. No, if you are not well trained theologically, you might think it doesn't matter. But 
He is truly man and yet truly God. So he is God in every sense of the word. And yet God is captured in full man. So he had two natures. He had the full nature of man and he had the full nature of God. Without the two forming a new hybrid. He wasn't hybrid of God and man. He wasn't. He was truly God and truly man. Right? What was Jesus? Truly God. One more time. How many natures did Jesus have? What are the two natures Jesus had? Human nature and divine nature. Okay, we say divine nature. <laughs> So, okay, for some of you, let me just say God nature so you can make it easier. So he had the human nature and the divine nature. And the human, the divine nature wrapped himself with the human nature. That's why he needed the Holy Spirit before he started his miracles. Because he didn't do those miracles with, as God. He did those miracles as man. So that you and I have hope. Now, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are restricted to his human living on, physical human living on this earth. The human living. So, as soon as, soon as if, look how Luke, who has taken his time to write an orderly account from the beginning to the end. As soon as Jesus left, <laughs> he stopped. Because there's nothing else to write about the human life of Jesus uh, uh, the human earthly life of Jesus. The physical life. There's nothing else to He's gone. But you know what's interesting? He went with the human nature. That's what gives us hope. He went with the human nature. And in, in, first, in first Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, he said, there is one God. Okay? So those who say Christians believe in three gods, it's not uh, 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 tr- 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 tritheism. Is monotheism. Christians don't believe in tritheism. Trinity is not tritheism. It's three unity. Three. Three. And yet unity. So made the word out of it. Trinity. So there's a difference between tritheism and monotheism or trinity. The trinity is monotheism. One God. It's there in our scriptures. It's there. For there is how many? One God. How many? One. When particularly the, some of the Islamists who like always want to challenge Christianity, that's, that's one of the things. You be Christians believe in three gods. We don't. There's one God. One God. One God. One, one essence. One nature. One nature. But three persons in one nature. That's I'm not issue on the Trinity. So there is one God and one mediator between God and men, not and man. God and men. Someone is in the middle, mediating, bringing us together. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their Second Corinthians chapter five, verse nineteen, not counting their trespasses again. So reconciliation. There's one God and uh, 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 there's one God and one, not two mediators, not three mediators. There are no other religious leaders that can bring you to God. The Bible says that. I'm not, that's what the Bible has got to say. Okay, it doesn't need reference from anyone. He has his own, own authority. Do you understand that? There is one God and how many mediators? So anyone who promises you another mediator is speaking on the behalf of the devil. That's how you know the devil talking. There's another gospel. We're telling you about something else. There's no, there's nothing else. And you, you know, you never know. What else do I have to know? The Bible is unambiguous about it. It's different if there is some ambiguity and uncertainty. Then the gray area. This one is not one of the gray areas. Okay, it's not one of the, there are things that people, other Christians, senior theologians disagree on. 
Should we baptize? Some people have been there. Should we baptize babies? Or we shouldn't baptize babies? There's a whole lot of... And those who say, let's baptize babies, they have some serious theological arguments they can put forth. And then those who say, let's not baptize babies, only believers, they also have strong biblical arguments. And so sometimes, and some of you know, I know that one of the areas that you have been concerned about is the speaking of tongues. Sometimes there are people who are serious theologians who don't even believe that tongues are necessary to be spoken. And there are also serious theologians who can show you why tongues is, is, is really part of the Christian life. And these are gray areas. So this person will stand this way. Definitely there's one correct answer, all right? But these are not essential for salvation. Whether you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues, whether you worship on Saturday or you worship on Sunday, it's not essential for salvation. That is why even some places they say women should cover their hair. Some other places they say women shouldn't wear earrings or shouldn't use makeup and all those as other things. <laughs> you can be a woman if you choose to cover your hair. It doesn't make you not non-Christian. Because it's, it's not essential for salvation. But the things that are essential for salvation is what I'm overstressing. And the, no true gospel marginalizes those areas. The things that are essential for salvation are the very things that other religions attack. Because that is what Satan is afraid of. Without that one, no one can be saved. But when that is in place, all other things, doesn't matter what happens, when that is in place, you can be saved and even grow now on that. And some of the things that are essential for salvation, critical of all of them is Jesus is God. Is 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 God in the flesh. It's critical. Listen, like last Sunday I said, if you deny the resurrection, you can't be saved. It's as simple as, oh, what do you mean? It's not my idea. It's not somebody's opinion. <laughs> it's your date of birth, your opinion, or somebody's opinion. <laughs> are there people, are there no people here who have different date of birth from the original time they were born? <laughs> Footballer from some nation. <laughs> and sometimes, Sometimes people can miss it. Someone can miss the dates because of records keeping. It wasn't kept properly. <laughs> but however, whatever the case, there was a day you were there. One, there was a certain moment you came out. Yeah, you. So it's a fact. You were born a certain, a certain and your mothers can never be two. Your mothers can never be, and even fatherhood. Fatherhood can never, no, no, no one has two fathers. Your mother may not know, but there's only one of them. <laughs> one true father. One. One. So these are facts that you can't circumvent. In the same way, the cardinal theory, necess- oh, sorry, belief, necessary for salvation, the cardinal doctrine necessary for salvation is Jesus is God who became human and yet he didn't lose his godness and he didn't upgrade his humanity to become a pseudo-human, some unusual human. That's why he didn't have temptation. He did! He did! Bible was not ambiguous about that. He said he had a temptation. In order not to go too far from the main point, he says that there is one God and one mediator. How many mediators? I can't hear you. When somebody su- suggests another mediator, asks, is he, is he called Jesus? And is it Mara, Mother Mary? Is he the son of God? If he says not the son of God, so no, no, that's not a mediator. That's a paper tiger. <laughs> And watch this, the point I'm bringing. There's one God, one mediator between God and man. Who? The who? The who? Not the God. The man? Bible says that, and God raised him and seated him on his right hand. So the same Jesus who resurrected now, for the first time in history, he took the human nature 
and inserted the human nature in the Trinity. So, no, it doesn't mean that the human being became God, but he took the human nature into God. When he was coming down, he brought the God nature into man. That's why it's called Emmanuel, God. Emmanuel, God. So he, when he was coming, when he was, his initi- first initiation, in his initiation is called incarnation. When he was being, coming as a human being, he brought the nature of God into man. And then through the process he went through, the passion, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection, that is the mystery about the resurrection, that for the first time in history, somebody died and came back. He came back. That's why he said, he said, Thomas, you don't believe it's me. Look at my wounds. Feel it. It's there. It's the same body. It's not um, another body. It's the same body in a glorified state, but it's the same. So what it means is that at the resurrection, I will see you. Well, when I see, I'll know it's you. It's not like spirits, it's not like spirits floating in the air. No! The Christian resurrection is hey, it's bodily physical, bodily resurrection. That's a Christian doctrine. You don't need that to be saved, though, by new Jesus' believe to you have to believe in Jesus' bodily resurrection to be saved. But you don't have to believe in the bod- bodily resurrection of the Christian to be saved. You're already saved. When you wake up, you notice that, oh, it's true. <laughs> it's true. So, back to the point. Jesus Christ, physical living, there was, a, there was a point in time when he physically became a human. There was a point in time. That's what is captured by the Christmas story. There was a point in time. That is why celebrating of Christmas is not too much an ask. Even though there was no emphasis of, on that in scripture, two of the gospel writers they didn't mention it. But two mentioned it because it's also essential. God, Bible says to, in, in Isaiah, God himself give you a sign. So Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. A virgin shall conceive and give birth. Who says this? How can a virgin conceive and give birth to a son? Give birth to a son? Pathogenesis, which is an extreme scientific um, phenomenon, extreme, one in billions, where the female egg will fertilize itself and begin begin to multiply. And in all extreme cases, in some animals, it happens. Human beings is one that's like in trillions or something like that. You won't even know about it because it's extreme rare situation, it's a biological situation where the female egg will begin to spontaneously multiply and then it becomes a fetus. Without the involvement of a man. It's called scientifically pathogenesis. And even in that, the, the result will always be a female. So even in extreme scientific situation where a virgin's egg, a virgin the main, in meaning that an egg has not been fertilized with spermatosum in the womb, and the egg begins to be, multiply itself, it's called pathogenesis. And in all extreme, because women don't have the, you know, their, their chromosome. It's only X. So in all cases, he only produces a female. But this one, he said, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. No, how? How can he? He said, it's a sign from the Lord. God himself will give you a sign. And then when he comes, you shall call his name God with a... Ah, Isaiah. Now, when he arrived, that initiation, throughout his life, and he died, he resurrected. That was the full spectrum of his human living, and watch this, human ministry. His ministry on earth. His physical, in his physical life. But when he died and resurrected, his ministry had not finished. That's what Luke is saying. Former one, I told you what he began to do and to teach, and he showed himself alive until he was taken. But after he was taken, he was initiated again. The two initiations of Christ. The first one was, what, which one is it? Initiated into human living. The second one is when he resurrected with the human nature and was ascended. So believers don't underestimate the value, the importance of the ascension. 
After resurrection, he has sealed. That's why I said the telestai. It is finished. He has finished his human assignment, physical, in the physical life, tangible life. But after the resurrection, he had to be initiated. That's a very important point I'm making. He had to be initiated. That is the ascension. He was initiated and he sat at the right hand of the Father. Is that the all? And then he started his second phase of his earthly ministry. So, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it captures only, after the first initiation, his ministry in his physical life on earth. Then the epistles take you into his ministry in his heavenly life. So even though he's, he's, he's in heaven, he's still living his life on earth. His, oh, don't you know he has a body? His body is here. The body is here. The head is there. Can you imagine? Oh, the church. The church. The body. The body is here. The, so now, that's why I keep saying the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does not encapsulate the entire complete gospel. Because the gospel is not complete if you restrict it only to his physical human living. Or his ministry on earth when he was physically here. Now that he's not physically here, he's gone up. His ministry on earth continues. What was the transitional moment? How did he do it? That's what Acts takes care of. So Acts begin to tell us about his initiation into heaven to continue his ministry. So he began to do and to teach. He, he continued to, to do and to teach. This time, not physically, on earth. This time, from above. And that's what we are going to be enjoying through these seasons, the things. So really, it is called, in your Bible, you see it's called the Acts of the Apostles. Truly, it is not the Apostles' Act. When you study the Acts, the book of Acts very carefully, it's, you know, almost every book has um, um, categories or demarcations or Aspects. So the first aspect, he focused on this, then he moved on to this, then he moved on to this. You see, the preparation, the first aspect is the, how he prepared his disciples, his, sorry, his disciples for his heavenly ministry through them by the Holy Spirit. So it's more, and then the second aspect is how Jesus was propagated. He was, pro, he, pro, he was propagated by the Holy Spirit. So we are talking about how the resurrected and ascended Jesus was being propagated by the Holy Spirit through his apostles on earth for the producing of his body called the church. That, 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 and that's what has happened to many people who are Christians and they've missed the value of that aspect of the gospel. That aspect of the gospel, which is, has taken more time, 2,000 years. Jesus' physical life was 33 and a half years. His heavenly ministry, physical ministry, earthly ministry, heavenly ministry from heaven is over 2,000 years and it's still going. It's, it's still going. It's still going. And so, Acts kind of is like the dividing, the dividing book. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all finished how Jesus died in Jerusalem, and he appeared to his disciples, everybody saw him. Then you go to Romans, and it's like a letter to the Romans. Where did they come in? How, where, where are these guys from? Corinthians. Oh, where, where? Second where, where? Galatians? Where? Philippians? Where? Ephesians? Who are these guys? How did they come in? You can't know the other aspect of the New Testament without coming to the central point where the transition, the transition from Jesus' earthly ministry to his heavenly ministry. It happened in the book of Acts. Acts is a backbone book of the New Testament, the gospel. Actually, actually, as I was studying, it occurred to me, it seems to me, and I'm a bit more convinced about 98% or 99%, potentially 100. <laughs> really, 
100%. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all under Old Testament. The New Testament kicked in when he ascended and he sat in session and he poured himself. He poured himself as the Spirit upon us. That is when the church life. Because he didn't he say, I'll build my, I'll build my church? Yes. Didn't he say that? Yes. Hmm. The one who was sent to come and introduce Jesus to us. The forerunner. The forerunner. I mean, don't let us take for granted how he introduced Jesus. I thought on this. He introduced Jesus in the, the book of John. The next day, verse, nine, verse 29, John 1. The next day, John sees Jesus coming. It says that, behold, the Lamb of God. He introduced him as a little lamb. A lamb. But it's not only a lamb. Verse 33, a lamb with a dove. 33 says that I did not know. Anytime I read this, it just takes all my attention. I want to stay on it. Because you are coming to introduce someone you don't know. He said, I knew him not. Ah, So why are you doing that? I'm coming to introduce um, the one who is going to take care of the uh, company to you. And I can't say, well, I, I, he's amongst you. So I've been sent to come and introduce him to you. One of you is going to be the one to rule the company. And say, okay, tell us. Um, I don't know him. <laughs> I don't know him. So why are you here then? Get someone who knows. John said, I don't know him. But I was giving clues. The one who sent me, he said, the one, he said, the one who sent me left me in the, not in the, they don't leave me in the dark. He says that upon the one, the one upon whom you see the spirit descending and maybe some people, he came and went. (laughs) Holy Ghost came. Then he went. (laughs) Maybe, I'm not saying that, but maybe. But this one, he said, don't let us marginalize the word remain. The spirit came and remain. So the one you see, what, what, what is he? He is the one who baptizes. Oh, so Jesus is not only the lamb. He's not only the lamb. He's, John says that he presents as a lamb, and he said a lamb with a, with a dove. He's the one who baptizes. So he's not only a savior, but when he died to save, because that's the beginning. When he died in his physical living, because spirits don't die. So you have to be a human being to die. When he died, I taught you on Sunday, he had to resurrect to show you that his death was worked. The thing has worked. <laughs> because if he had not resurrected, the thing didn't work. He, <laughs> he tried it and then it's like you invest a lot of money into bits. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they tell you uh, every man 30%, 30 percent 30 percent 10 over 10 over every month and you put it in the first month it looked good so you added more money the second month look you added more money now after that fourth month <laughs> fifth month nothing is coming see a year three years now nothing is coming and you've lost all the money you want to withdraw the money say sorry it's, everything has gone bonkers did it work? Did your investment work? No. Now, Jesus Christ, he said, let's go. I'm telling you, I'm going and I'll come back because this thing works. So I've been sent. I want you to know I'm God. Number two, I want you to know I've been sent to pay the price for sins. So, okay, give it a go. He said, I'm, I'm coming. He told them I'll come the third day. He said, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Did he, did he not tell you whilst he was with you that on the third day he'll rise? Why are you coming here to look for him? He's not here. He's risen. So he went and he rose, and the disciples realized, oh, he's the, he, 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 actually, he is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He's the sin bearer. But he wasn't only a sin bearer. So afterwards, he began to teach them. They, were, they would be very excited. They said, wait, 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 there's actual work to do. There's actual work to do. I need to be propagated. Rome's, uh, the Romans must hear about me. The Corinthians must hear about me. The British must hear about me, and the Americans, because when they hear about me, they'll make a lot of noise and eventually make a business out of it. So they will, they... <laughs> Somebody once said that when the gospel got to the Jews, they made a religion out of it. When it got to the Romans, they made an institution out of it. When it got to the, uh, the British, they made a culture out of it. 
And when you go to the Americans, they made a business out of it. And when you go to the Africans, they made an entertainment. <laughs> so I must be propagated. But that, that's the call. He said, but you can't do it. You, you can't propagate me. You can't. You don't have what it takes. I must do it myself. But all I need is you as a vessel so I can pour myself into you. When I pour myself, look at the amount of persecution the early church went through. They went through persecution. Right from chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, persecution starts. We'll, we'll go into that. They went through so much persecution, they didn't have t- tried and approved and tested leaders. No, maybe their leaders are from Oxford, Yale, highly educated, well tested, approved that these are the ones who can leave, lead. They didn't have that. They didn't have money. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have power. They were not into They didn't have anything. And they were most hated and most persecuted and punished. And yet there was no community they couldn't penetrate and grow. There was no, what, what accounts for that? It is the Jesus himself through the spirit. So the spirit is the one who propagates Jesus in the believers. So he's he's working. That's why I said, wait for the spirit. Wait for the promise because you cannot go and propagate me. You cannot. You cannot. But the spirit will not come until my second initiation. So for 40 days, he was telling them things, teaching them things. They were excited. Just before I go, he said, wait. When I go, I'll receive of the spirit and I'll send him to you. And when the spirit comes, verse 8, Acts chapter 1, then you shall be witnesses of me. Ah, ah, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost part of the world. And there's no way that you can be restricted. The only way they can stop your influence is to make a law that you can preach. But if they don't make a law, it must be so sad. That's why some nations. It's illegal to try and preach Christ. It's illegal. And if we don't wake up, it's coming here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have seen that by now. In a lot of places in our community, it's illegal to do anything, Jesus. Say anything, Jesus. Where us people are singing the gospel and police officers on the streets of London are telling them that, no, if you want to sing gospel, go and do it in church. You can't sing in public places. Hey! Even though it's not endorsed by the law, it was a mistake. The Metropolitan Police has apologized. But is something like this? Should something like this happen before apology? Oh, that's extreme. That tells you the psyche of the people that are in this country, especially in the universities. The universities. That is why we have to have stronger presence in universities. We have to have strong presence in parliament. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. We need to pray for the Christians who are in all these places, in top, top places. We need to pray for them. Because we live in a generation where your Christian voice is not wanted. In politics especially. We don't want any Christian voice. If you, if you stand for office and you say, I'm a Christian, the media will vandalize, will put you after you and make sure that you can you can hold public office if you're a Christian. You can be a nominal Christian. It's very I go to church like American president. I go to church and <laughs> by a few. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to go into politics, but <laughs> if you are going to bring it on the forefront, it's not compatible with the Western society now. No. The Western society frowns on it used to be Christians who were in power and made room for everybody to come in. Everybody comes in, say, oh, but you people are not tolerant. So go back, go back, go back, go back. And now a time is coming. It's no more, we can't tolerate you anymore now. It's the ties are turning. If you think I'm lying, go to your workplace and just break time, take your Bible and read. You are like, you're like, your boss is likely to sack you unless you are indispensable. For the company. You read your Bible at work. On the train, people will look at you strange. 
breathing backward? Are you so backward? But any other thing is good. So oh, that's so nice. Yoga, oh, that's, 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 that's so nice. Oh, that's so nice. You tie your hair with those. Ah, oh, that's so nice. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what was this other? Come on. <laughs> so, it's important to understand that Jesus Christ did not finish his work. It's his entire ministry on earth. On earth, he finished his earthly ministry. But now the good news is we are here because of the heavenly ministry Jesus is still carrying on. The heavenly ministry of Jesus. Did you everybody receive something? Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. Jesus is alive! Yeah. He didn't remain on the cross. He's alive. And guess what? He's alive in the church by his spirit and he's propagating himself by the spirit through the church. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. So the church cannot stop preaching about Jesus. In fact, if it's Jesus, he will talk about himself. Amen. Well, before we close, I want us to pray. I want you to pray and say, Lord, help me to make myself available for your spirit to use me, for your agenda. He has an agenda. That's why I said, wait, after I'm dead and gone, wait, because there's a plan. I've got a plan. I've got an agenda. I've got a purpose. I've got an assignment. I've got a commission. He gave a commission. But the, and guess what? When he comes back, he's going to reward us based on the commission, the role we have played in the commission. It's not what you have done which others can do. The only thing others cannot do is to carry out the commission. And we can only do that by his spirit upon us. And I want us to pray that Holy Spirit move upon me. Give me, shall we all rise to our feet, please? Give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace that I will not be irrelevant in your work. I will not be useless to you. Holy Spirit, give me grace that I'll be useful. I'll be useful for your purpose. Lord, give me grace. I'm ready. I open up myself. Give me grace where I am weak, where I'm not doing well, where I've been flopping, where I've been missing it. Help me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me to be useful to you. Help me to be one of those you will use for your assignment on earth. You will carry out your heavenly ministry too. And help me to be one of those. I know you want to use me, but sometimes my dullness of hearing, sometimes my, 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 my appetite, my direction, my, my preoccupation distracts me from becoming available. Lord, help me. Help me in every area of my life. Somebody pray right now. Help me in every area of my life that I'll be useful to you. In spite of your age, whether you are a child or you are an elderly person, you are still useful to God. You can still be useful to God. You want to pray that, Lord, help me. Help me to be relevant for you. Help me. Help me. Help me to obey you. Help me to work with you. Help me to allow you to carry out your heavenly ministry through me in any shape or any form, in various ways and various means. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Somebody pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. If I were you, I will throw up my arms to heaven and ask heaven, help me. Heaven, help me. Father, help me. If there's a decision to make, go ahead and say, Lord, from today, I'm making a decision that I will actually be more available for you. I'll prioritize the things concerning the kingdom. I'll make myself more available because you physically are not here. That's why you have kept me here, to be your physical representative, to be your physical reflection, to be your physical re 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 representation. Help me, Lord by your spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome into my life. Fill me afresh. Fill me afresh. Fill me afresh. Fill me afresh, oh Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh so we can do your work. Fill us afresh so we can do anything you want done. You, wh whatever you want us to do, give us the grace. Fill us afresh. From today, we receive the grace. We receive grace to, to do whatever you want us to do, oh Lord. We receive grace. We receive grace. Father, we thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you that before you, we chose to come to you, you chose us. We did not call you, neither did we call ourselves. You called us and ordained us to bear fruits 
and bring to bring forth fruits that will remain we cannot bear fruits without being in tune with you we can't bear fruits without following your instructions and commandments we can't follow your instructions and commandments entirely by our own human strength this at this moment we ask you pour your spirit afresh upon us pour your spirit afresh upon us pour your spirit afresh upon us oh lord so we can be very very efficient and effective tools in your hands we know you are physically not here that's why you have kept us here physically so we will be your reflection will be your representation and representatives give us the grace any area in our lives where we have we are missing you we are missing your instructions or we are being disobedient or we are weakened and we for that matter cannot honor you the way we should we pray for grace we pray for grace to overcome grace to overcome and grace to walk with you grace to reflect you grace to represent you holy spirit fall afresh upon us upon us as a church on all our branches and our sister churches fall upon the church in london fall upon the church in united kingdom fall upon your church in europe fall upon your church in this generation come afresh again upon us that Christ will be propagated to the ends of the earth by you yourself to your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah.